Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of November 29th. Last week of November, last few days, and into the first days of December. John Eldridge here, flying solo this week. Hope that you had a good Thanksgiving, those of you who celebrate Thanksgiving, at least here in the Americas. We are entering the first week of Advent, and I love Advent. I love the Advent season. I love it because in this post-postmodern hour, post-post-Christian world, the world has been just stripped of liturgy. The world has been disenchanted. And I think what we see in the heartache around Christmas, just the longing for things to be beautiful and special and holy, and the attempt of some of us to recover a liturgy, at least tradition, that allows us to something of the re-enchantment of the Christian story. I have loved for years, when we were parents of young children, we would gather every evening around the kitchen table, and we would start our our Advent wreath, lighting the first candle, and all of the beauty of that, the imagery, the symbolism. Oh, what's this? What's this candle, mom and dad? Oh, that's the hope candle, or that's the Christ candle, or, you know. And then we would pray and we would sing carols around the table just about every evening all through Advent. And I love watching the the candles burn down uh, over the weeks. And of course, they're kind of burned down in like a staggered way. And the hope and the expectation, just the way it anchors you in, oh, we are in Christmas season, we are in Advent, and we are looking forward to Christmas and to all that this means together. And, you know, the richness of the carols. We, what we're doing, gang, what the attempt of this is, whatever your Christian tradition, is the attempt to rehearse the story. And it's really good to rehearse the story in an hour like ours, where we are just bombarded with so many other stories, so many, so many other attempts to arrest our attention and, and try and kind of give us a new narrative, right? It's the battle of narratives. And it's hard to hang on to the Christian narrative. It's hard to hang on to the fact that the story of God is still the story of this world, that the story of Jesus, that we rehearse now maybe with a little bit more focus, has been, is now, and always will be the story of the world. And so that's, in my mind at least, that's the purpose of the Advent season. It's an attempt to recover some enchantment, some liturgy, some of the sacred out of the profane, and to help our hearts back into the story of God and the power, the power of the story of God. I'd like to do a little bit of that re-enchanting here with you this week. I'd like to rehearse the story with you, but I think in a new way, a way that you might not have thought about it before. The first candle of Advent, the first Sunday, is the hope candle or the prophecy candle, as it's often called, because Jesus Christ is the desire of nations. And you have that exquisite moment when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus into the temple to dedicate him, and a man named Simeon is there because God told Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. 
And can you imagine the hundreds and hundreds of years, the heartache for the coming of the Messiah? And this man, this beautiful, special man, we don't know much about him. We don't, we don't know that he was a major prophet of the day. He wasn't the high priest, but he is a friend of God. And I love what's said about him. And he was looking for, he was watching for the consolation of Israel. And then, you know, he holds Jesus and, and he just declares, God, you have fulfilled your promise. So the first week we rehearse the hope in the prophecies around the coming of Jesus into the world. I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. And of course, that, like that passage or some part of it will often get put on Christmas cards with a picture of the star over the stable and light emanating from you know, the stable there in, in Bethlehem in the dark night all around it and mighty kings coming to see your radiance. You have the magi bowing, right, to bring their gifts to the king of the world, to the Messiah. But gang, here's what I love about this. That fabulous passage is actually the beginning of one of the places where Isaiah describes the hope and the promise of what this new king will do, of what this redemption is, and what it is, is the return of Eden. Let me just go on in Isaiah 60. Look and see, for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine and your heart will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. No longer will you need the sun to shine by day nor the moon to give its light by night. For the Lord your God will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set, your moon will not go down, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will come to an end. Are you catching the echoes of this from Revelation 21, where John sees the new heavens and the new earth, the recreated earth? and the city of God coming down, okay? This, this is right out of that. Your sun never setting, your moon not going down, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will come to an end. All people, all your people will be righteous. Oh, what a lovely, lovely thought that is. No more evil in the world. They will possess the land forever, for I will plant them there with my own hands in order to bring myself glory. Isaiah 60 is one of a multitude of places in the Old Testament, parts and imagery of which get repeated in the New Testament around the birth of Christ and around the coming of the kingdom of God. And what we're wanting to do as we rehearse the story is to recognize, oh my goodness, the promise of the light of the world coming into a dark world are the opening sentences of the Old Testament prophecies about the recovery of Eden. So there's another marvelous place this takes place in Jeremiah 33. 
He says, in those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. Now that, again, that often gets quoted like on a Christmas card or in a sermon, right? Here's Jesus. Here is the promised king from King David's line. But we have to back up because, again, these lines are part of the Jewish expectation, the declaration of the prophets, why they were so excited about the coming of this king in the line of David. So let me back up in Jeremiah chapter 33. This is what the Lord says. You have said, this is a desolate land where people and animals have all disappeared. And again, just to pause on the brilliance of the prophecy and the insight into our own hour, like in the last 30 years, the number of animals and species that continue to go extinct on the earth and the heartache over that and the longing to do something. Okay, so this is what the promise is. You have said this is a desolate land where people and animals have all disappeared, yet in the empty streets of Jerusalem and Judah's other towns, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and laughter. The joyful voices of bridegrooms and brides will be heard again, along with the joyous songs of people bringing thanksgiving offerings to the Lord. They will sing, give thanks to the Lord of heaven's armies, for the Lord is good. His faithful love endures forever. So there is this swelling promise of joy again, because God goes on to say, for I will restore the prosperity of this land to what it was in the past, says the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. This land, though it is now desolate and has no people and animals, will once more have pastures where shepherds can lead their flocks. Once again, shepherds will count their flocks in the towns of the hill country the foothills of Judah, the Negev, the land of Benjamin, the vicinity of Jerusalem, and all the towns of Judah, I, the Lord, have spoken. The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I have promised them. And then he goes on to say, in those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. In that day, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. So here you have these fragments of the prophecies we often hear in Advent about the light of the world coming into the world, about the descendant, the king from David's line. But what God is promising is restoration of the land itself, the restoration of beauty and joy, that the recreation of the world. And what I want to bring to our hearts this week is, is a new perspective that this is what we are looking to in Advent as we rehearse the story of God. We are rehearsing not just the prophecies and the fulfillment of the promises of the coming king, but all of the expectation and the promise of God that that coming king will do for our lives and for the world. So now you can hear it in Revelation 21, which is just saturated with Old Testament imagery. And, and, it, and as we grasp that Old Testament imagery and make the connections here, it really expands our understanding that he's talking about Eden. He's talking about 
the restoration that Christ promised in Matthew 19, when he said, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, at the palingenesia, as the Greek says, the restoration of all things. So here is John, who is just steeped in that tradition, telling us of what he sees. And then I saw a renewed heaven and a renewed and restored earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And I love I love that part because it's almost like John, he's dumbstruck. It's like, what? All of it? It's all coming true? And God has to say to him, yeah, yeah, keep, keep writing this down. It's true. And then he goes on to say, and he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And then in chapter 22, John kind of focuses in. He's got this global vision going on of restoration and the coming of the city of God, and then he goes into the city, and he sees the tree of life, and he sees the river of life flowing down through the very middle of the city. This is extraordinary because you go back to, for example, Paul's understanding of what Christmas is about. It, it is contextually the beginning of the recovery of Eden. Romans 8, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now, this is right out of Jeremiah 33. This is right out of the, the prophecies in Isaiah that he is going to restore the land and reestablish his people in the land. The story of God that we are rehearsing begins in Eden. It begins in the gorgeous saturated, life-giving world, and we as the partners of God in it. And then, of course, the tragedy that follows, the rebellion in Eden, the rebellion of the human race down through the ages, but the promise of the descendant of David's line who will come and usher in the return of Eden, right? All creation is waiting eagerly for that day. Okay, so back to Isaiah now in chapter 65. It's just astounding how you can begin to hear and see the interplay of the Old and New Testaments and clarifying for us what the actual prophecy is and what the hope and the promise 
of this coming king, the light of the world, who we will see enter into the story, the incarnate God in Bethlehem. Isaiah 65, look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Like we just heard that repeated in Revelation 21. I will wipe away every tear. I love this though. It goes on, the prophecy and the promise. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. This is exactly what Jesus is promising in Matthew 19. And you may recall this from podcasts and discussions around the idea of all things new, that Peter and the guys are beginning to wonder, if not fear, that following Jesus is going to prove to be too costly. And he asks him, he says, look, we've, we've given up everything to follow you. What are we looking forward to? And Jesus smiles and he says, I tell you the truth, which is like Revelation 21. I'm telling you the truth. Write this down. He says, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will receive again, and then he names relationships, family, loved ones, children. He names houses and lands, like right out of these Old Testament prophecies, anchoring the promise in the absolutely real and tangible, the future destiny of our lives, the culmination of the story we're rehearsing is not heaven. It's not. In Acts chapter 3, Peter's giving this amazing sermon, and he says this. He says, Jesus must remain in heaven until the time appointed when God will restore everything. And what happens at that point? What is the until that we're just absolutely holding our breath over? It's the return of the king and the restoration of Eden. The return of the king brings the return of Eden, but on a far more sweeping scope than we have anticipated. So I've been appreciating very much the Bible Project podcast and videos, and if you haven't had a chance to dial into those guys, they're really doing a good work in the world. Let me quote Dr. Tim Mackey on Revelation and on these prophecies that he's riffing on. He says, it's an all-new Garden of Eden, the paradise of eternal life with God. This is an image of the Old Testament prophetic echoing all the way back to the first pages of Genesis. And then speaking of Revelation 22, he says, John saw the tree of life there, accessible to all and eternally yielding fruit. It could do this because its roots had access to the eternal river of life, which can dispense nourishment to all the new creation because it flows from the presence of God himself. However, in John's account of a garden, and again, he's, he's referring to Revelation as the return of the garden, humanity wasn't represented by a couple. John describes seeing all the nations there working to cultivate the garden as Adam and Eve did in Genesis. For John, the fulfillment of God's purpose through Jesus would result in the restoration of humans to their place as co-rulers of God's world, ready to work with God to take creation into uncharted territory. It means that there will be no need for a physical temple 
or holy of holies, and again, John says that, there is no temple in Revelation 21 and 22. He says, I saw no temple there. And that's very, very significant because in the new creation, the fullness of God's presence will be everywhere. All of the new creation will be God's holy of holies. All of the world will be Eden. So back in Genesis, Eden is a place. It it is a part of the earth that God created in chapter one. And in Eden, God plants a garden, but the intended purpose was that humanity would make the whole world Eden through our creative life with God. And the sounds of singing will be heard in it, the sounds of joy, the bridegroom and brides, all of those beautiful things, the passage I love, the ransomed of the Lord will return, Isaiah says, singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads as we work together and live and thrive as we build the houses and the vineyards promised to us in the new creation. Oh, friends, what we are looking forward to as we celebrate Advent is the re-enchantment of the world. Let me quote very briefly from Dr. Michael Heiser now, and again, another great podcast to recommend, the Naked Bible Podcast. Heiser says this, the Eden imagery at the end of the book of Revelation is obvious as that can be the only context for the tree of life. All that was originally intended in God's vision of a global Eden has come to pass. So this is the story that we are rehearsing. And now you can begin to see some of our attempts in things like the lights, okay? Stacy and I love the lights of Christmas. People, you know, put lights up on their houses. We decorate trees with lights inside and out. We love to drive around our community in the evening and just look at the lights. Why? Why is that so filled with goodness and hope? Well, because it is the re-enchantment of the world, right? The light of the world has come into the darkness and all of the beauty and the wonder. Well, that's McDonald's, oh, his precious letter to his dying daughter. You know, friends, I mean, it hasn't been very many centuries before most people lost children to death as a normal course of human experience. And our beloved George MacDonald, the Scottish poet, pastor, prophet, writer, lost several children. He's writing a letter to his adult daughter, who is dying, and he says to her, all of the wonder and joy that we see at Christmas time will be ours. And I love his connection of that to the new earth, to the new Eden. So we drive around, we look at lights, you know, we put them on our house. And isn't it fascinating, gang, it, that last Christmas, if you can go back to Christmas 2020, where people were leaving their Christmas lights up through like June. Uh, A friend of mine, once the pandemic rolled in and the quarantines rolled in, his son asked if they could put their Christmas lights back up in March. uh, We had people in our neighborhood who left their Christmas tree up and decorated. So I'm assuming it was was an artificial Christmas tree. They left it up the entire year. You could see it, you know, standing there, gosh, you know, 10 feet high in their living room window in in the heat of July. And part of me was like, what are you doing, folks? And another part of me was like, oh, I get it. I get it. We saw that ache for life to be good again. We saw all the things that we've been talking about this fall 
in the traumatized human condition and the yearning for life to be good again. And then around Christmas time, you know, we take it up several notches with beauty and celebration and parties and gifts and the trees. And do you see what we're doing? We're rehearsing the return of Eden. I mean, my goodness, like, okay, the gift giving thing. So I, in Revelation 22, as John is describing the new Jerusalem, he says, and the kings of the world will bring their treasures into it, which is right back to the promise in Isaiah 60 about your heart will thrill with joy, the wealth of nations will come to you. Okay, so these gifts are being brought in, and I think it's the creative works of the sons and daughters of God kind of coming. You know, kids love to come in and show their parents what they did. You know, we're bringing all our great stuff to be celebrated, and and that's what the gift giving's about. Right? What we're doing is we're foreshadowing that part of the new Eden and the lights and the beauty and the re-enchantment, the feasting. <laughs> Come on, gang. Do you see what this is? Do you see this is so deep in, in the human psyche? We typically feast somewhere in the holiday season. Now, some of us feast a little too much. But the the sweets, the treats, the dinners, you know, some communities have, you know, special dinners that they do and all that, even going out to take meals to the homeless and those in need, trying to throw them a party. Do you see that? Well, that's the wedding feast. What we're doing here in Advent and in the Christmas season is we are rehearsing the coming of the King, the return of Eden, the new Jerusalem, the recreation of the world. And we are, we are rehearsing and all of the joy and laughter will fill its streets. We're, we're rehearsing and reminding our desperate, weary hearts of the return of Eden that it is coming right down to the Christmas tree, okay? So here, here's a new way of understanding that. I know there's kind of a bizarre tradition out of Germany with the Christmas tree, but look, people are pulling beauty into their homes, plopping it in the middle of their living rooms, lighting it up, there's the lights again, and then decorating it in all these different beautiful ways. It's the tree of life. These are like flags. They're symbols. They're little, little tiny, awkward icons of the tree of life, which some theologians believe was like literally glowing in the Garden of Eden with the presence of God. It was just radiating light and goodness. And so here we have these little radiating trees of beauty that we set in our homes, apartments, you know, in our cubicles, these attempts to re-enchant the world and to remind ourselves of Eden and that the new Eden is coming. Let me close with this thought. If this broken world cannot be mended in any other way, apart from the return of its king, the descendant of David's line. And if the return of the king ushers in the return of Eden, the renewal of all things, wouldn't our every hope be fixed on his coming on the second advent? And if we thought that the return was actually finally drawing near, closer than ever before, wouldn't we release all of our grasping? Wouldn't our hearts rest and rejoice? So here in Advent, we rehearse the story so that our weary, 
traumatized, besieged hearts won't forget so that we can take hold once again of the hope and the promise because the story we are rehearsing and declaring and proclaiming in all the things we do, from the carols to the candles to the lights to the gift giving to the feasting, all of it is proclaiming Eden. It's proclaiming the return of Eden. I thought that that might do your hearts good this Christmas time to reframe things in that way and to take hold of the promise and the hope that is truly ours. If you have found this to be hopeful, if you can feel your heart rising with a fresh and new understanding, maybe share this with your friends. You know, use the share function on your on your podcast app to pass along to folks who need to know what the story really is. 